Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today, we're going to be talking about reading IR spectroscopy. So, when we look at infrared spectroscopy, what is being measured? That's like the first thing we got to look at. So, in general, when you're looking at an IR spec readout, what the IR spec is showing you is where the molecule that you put inside of your machine is absorbing photons of infrared radiation. Okay, so again, picture you have your molecule inside of the IR spec and you're gonna be bombarding that with infrared radiation. And so different frequencies of infrared radiation are going to be absorbed by it. And when that happens, what you're going to get are different peaks. And so the peaks kind of look like this. So either you're gonna have like this broad shape or you're gonna have this really sharp shape. And so what that is showing you is where molecular bond vibrations are occurring. And so here's a FET simulation. So there's a FET simulation here that can kind of show you a little bit about what we're talking about. So this is carbon monoxide and I'm gonna shoot some infrared radiation at it. Notice that some of the radiation is able to pass through, but others are causing the bond, the triple bond here to vibrate a little bit. And so that molecular motion is able to get picked up by the infrared spectroscopy device. Um, again, we can pick different ones. So if we have like carbon dioxide, we get a different kind of motion again, depending on what frequency is being absorbed by it. But notice that not every frequency is absorbed. Um, you've got methane maybe, again, you'll see a molecular vibration occurring every now and again. Now, other than that, so moving on to the next part, what do you need to like recognize when we're looking at an IR spec? So when you look at the graph, there are a couple of regions that are extremely important to figure out like, what exactly does your molecule look like? So between 3,600 and 2,700 inverse centimeters on your graph, what you get is um, some atom that is connected to a hydrogen. Okay, so normally we're looking at carbons because this is organic, right? So a carbon-hydrogen bond would form somewhere between here. Um, and so again, not that important for the most part when we're looking at the structure. When we are looking at something that has a triple bond, though, that might be a little bit more useful to us. So that's between 2,700 and 1,900 inverse centimeters. Double bonds, so that would be 1,900 to 1,500. And then 1,500 to 500, that would be like a single bond. Now, the greater the mass of the attached atoms, the lower the frequency at which the bond will absorb. So what that means is that there is a direct correlation between the mass of whatever atom we're looking at, in this case, X or Y, and what frequency we actually see um, that absorption happening at. So here's an example of two IR specs that I put kind of over one another. And so this is chloroform CHCl3, okay, in red. And then uh, here's a heavier version of chloroform called the deutero chloroform. And so deutero um, is referring to the fact that we have basically heavy hydrogen here. And so notice that where we have this gigantic kind of peak um, is absent from um, deutero chloroform. And the reason why is because we don't have just that carbon hydrogen bond anymore. We don't. Instead, um, what we have is something that is a lot heavier. And so instead we get this, this extra kind of peak here. Um, we get this gigantic peak um, that is moved over just a little bit, um, which kind of lets us know that, okay, we have something that's more massive. The peak is a little bit more, um, a lower frequency, let's say. All right. So tongues and swords, what exactly are we talking about when we use the term tongues and swords? So a tongue is a broad appearance of that little peak that we just kind of showed. And so when we say a broad appearance, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the fact that instead of being this very sharp little jab, you end up with a very long and elongated shape instead. So it looks more like a parabola than it does anything else. And so these would be examples of tongues. Now, they are like the telltale sign that you have a hydroxyl group so that you have a alcohol somewhere in your structure. And so almost any time you see this broad shape, what you're going to be thinking is, okay, that means that there has to be an OH somewhere on my molecule. And so where do these tongues tend to occur? They tend to occur between 3,400 and 3,200, and that would be your telltale sign that you have an alcohol. Now note that we also have nitrogen-hydrogen bonds 
that also occur in that region, but usually they're a lot more pointed and they're not as broad as this. The more you see IR spec readouts, uh, the better you'll get at knowing the difference between, oh, okay, this is going to be more of like a alcohol that I'm looking at, whereas this would be more of like an amine. And another thing is that NH um, little uh, peaks here tend to have multiple peaks. So you don't just get like one big broad one, you tend to get little ones within it too. So you'll see a lot of up and down motion um, that can maybe let you know that you have a uh, um, an amine instead of an alcohol. And again, that has to do or is correlated more to how many NH bonds you have. Because if you have a lot of NH bonds, you're going to see a lot more movement in that region. So now that we know what a, a tongue is, what exactly is a sword? So a sword is a very sharp appearance. And there are a couple of telltale ones for that. And so the one that I'm going to show you is called the carbonyl sword. And so when we're looking at a carbonyl group, that occurs between 1630 and uh, 1800 inverse centimeters. And so you get this gigantic, very sharp movement in that region. So here like, are some aldehydes. We've got benzaldehyde and propanol. I'm sorry, propanol right here. You've got um, some ketones, for example. So you've got esters and carboxylic acids. And so notice that you get this really like ridiculously sharp pointed um, peak in those areas. And that's, again, the telltale sign that you have a carbonyl group. So other useful clues. Around 3,000 inverse centimeters, that's a pretty useful border for separating alkenes from alkanes. And so let me point that out on this chart that you saw on the very first slide here. So right here is 3,000 inverse centimeters. And so you can see that when it says that you are greater than 3,000, like right on the verge of 3,000, but on the opposite side of 3,000 here, that tends to tell you that you have um, instead a double bond somewhere. If instead on the opposite side of 3,000, so just a little bit before, instead you see a peak, that lets you know most likely that you have an alkane. And so this is kind of one of those um, one of those telltale areas you want to look for when you're trying to see like, hey, does this have a double bond? Um, if it does, it normally will appear in this region over here. Another one though is a peak that you might see around 2,100 to 2,260, and that's the indicator that you might have a triple bond instead. So that's right over here. Um, it's not a crazy peak that you normally see. It's normally very subtle, but normally this entire region of the IR spec is normally pretty boring. There's not a lot happening. So if you see something there, that lets you know that, okay, I have this situation occurring. And notice on this chart, we still have our carbonyl stretch here. And we have our nice tongue for our hydroxyl group there. So again, just to let you know, like, again, that's sometimes something that you might see. Now, here's, a, here's how slight that triple bond little movement might be. So again, just the tiniest of little bumps letting you know that we've got ourselves a triple bond. Um, and again, in this situation, it's a lot more, let's say, sharp. But normally, it's not that sharp at all. So other things to keep in mind. The point of IR is basically to find functional groups that might be more difficult to identify by other means. So if you're using NMR or something, um, proton NMR or carbon NMR, um, sometimes finding these functional groups means that you'd have to, have to do a little bit more work. IR spec is a great way to just identify some very obvious functional groups. Um, no one can look at an IR spec and determine the entire structure of the molecule from that. So don't expect that you're going to see an IR printout and say, okay, I can figure out where every single little functional group might be located in my molecule. That's not really the point. Now, the more IR specs you see, the better off you get at ignoring all of the noise that occurs. And a lot of it is useless information. But again, here's like something that you might look at a printout of and you might say, how am I supposed to interpret this? But there are just, again, a couple of key important things you need to look for um, using the chart that I showed you on the last slide and on the first slide that can help you figure out what's going on with regards to the spectrum. All right. So again, just as a reminder, here's the spectrum that we were looking at before where we have our little uh, key points. And so here is our uh, infrared spec that we're going to try to find. All right. So let's see if we can figure out what some important identifying features might be in this IR spec. 
So something that you probably noticed right away is that we have this, again, OH stretch, right? We have this hydroxyl group that's pretty obvious here. And so I would say that that's pretty obvious and it does occur between 3,200 and 3,400 because this is 3,000 right here. So that means that we definitely are going to have an alcohol present. Now, you might also take a look at this and think, what else do I have going on? But in reality, the rest of this is pretty much just noise. And again, um, if you're looking at like this chart, you're like, oh, look, I, maybe I can see all the rest of the stuff. But in reality, this is the only important bit of information that you'd probably be able to get out of this IR spec. And so this is one hexanol, and one hexanol has this kind of like structure. So it's that alcohol that we kind of are identifying that looks very let's say, um, obvious to us in this IR. Let's see if we can find a couple more here, though. So look, um, here's another broad um, hydroxyl kind of uh, tongue. Here's another one, and here's another one. So just to show you like how obvious that might be when you're looking for an alcohol in your IR spec. All very, very obvious, and all, again, between those little um, frequencies and stuff that we were looking at before. All right, again, using this, let's, let's look at another one. So here, what do we think we can identify? You probably spot, hey, okay, I know that there's going to be an alcohol here again. But here's something that's super, super sharp. And look, it's touching the very bottom of our graph here. And so that is occurring, though, where? Right around here. So this is 2,000. This is 1,000. So this is occurring, again, somewhere between... Um, you know, um, 1,800 ish, um, 1,700 ish. Notice that that's what we call our carbonyl stretch. So think about your functional groups. If I have a carbonyl group and I have an alcohol, what does that let me uh, know is usually a functional group I associate with those two things. And that would be a carboxylic acid. So we definitely have a carboxylic acid present. And actually, this is butanoic acid. So I've got, again, my my nice tongue here, spotting, um, again, pretty easily using the chart. And then here I have my carbonyl um, little um, sharp peak, which is obviously right here. And so again, just using all of the tools that you have available to you to figure that out. And so again, to show you some, some, some nice little uh, peaks and valleys again, um, here we have our nice um, uh, alcohol groups. And then here, I have my carbonyl group. So these are all carboxylic acids. And so here's the other thing, and this is the last bit, but it requires a lot more precision. The position of where that carbonyl stretch will vary slightly depending on what functional group contains it. So it does require careful precision. Do not expect to be able to just know all of these and be able to spot them, especially even the printouts that I just showed you. The printouts, oops, the printouts that I showed you right now, those all are really difficult to tell what range we're looking at. But aldehydes occur at this range, ketones, esters, carboxylic acids, and then amides. Again, you have to have a really precise graph, though, in order to tell what's going on with regards to these functional groups. But again, it's within the range of that carbonyl stretch. It's just, again, you can tell based on like just slight variations in where it's located on the graph, whether it's aldehyde, a ketone, an ester, carboxylic acid, or amide. So again, if you have any questions, please let me know. And that would be it for this lesson.